All right, here we go with a review of advertising and its techniques, specifically geared toward Mr. Orr's STEM Language Arts 9 class. In our class, we're going, to, we're going to consider there to be three purposes for communication, to inform, to persuade, to entertain. Inform purposes of gathering and sharing information and data, to persuade, to change someone's mind, thoughts, actions, emotions, or to entertain to have someone evoke a certain feeling, um, whether that be happiness, laughter, sadness, etc. Some people will add to express as a fourth purpose for communication, but for our class we're only going to consider that as a part of entertainment. All right, not a trick question, but is advertising mostly informative, persuasive, entertaining? Right, so it's mostly persuasive. But how's, how I want you to think about advertising in terms of these purposes, think of it like a pie graph. Rarely, if ever, is it going to be equally balanced between these three, but also equally unlikely is that some kind of communication or some message is going to be 100% only informative or persuasive or entertaining. There's usually a blend of two, if not all three, of these purposes. And in that pie graph, the proportions or the ratios to one to another are going to vary depending on not just the content of the message, but also in terms of the delivery and the audience itself. In terms of persuasive communication, there's three types of appeals. First, an appeal will use the dictionary.com definition of the power or ability to attract, interest, amuse, or stimulate the mind or emotions. For our purposes, I like this definition because first of all, at the end, it, it focuses on either the mind or emotions. So it's either the mental or emotional state of, uh, of mind or perspective. Also, I like the fact that it doesn't try to put appeal into simply one verb, but really attract, interest, amuse, or stimulate. Really gets at the, the full sense of an appeal, that it's, we're not necessarily always sure how or why, but it definitely draws us to something or it piques something in us that wants us, makes us want to know more. Okay, so in terms of appeals, persuasion is usually accomplished through the use of one or more of these three types of appeal. First, an appeal to logic or reason. This is where we use facts and other data to change someone's mind. This is also called argumentation. Again, it's not only done for informative purposes, but we're using these things to support or advocate for a position. Argumentation doesn't simply mean that people are in an argument, but it's that use of logic or reason to build and construct a carefully crafted argument to get to a particular end or goal. Appeals to emotion. This is oftentimes the use of symbols and other interpretive ideas to influence a particular emotion or feeling. So the idea here is that we're going to try to get someone stirred up in some sense, whether it be, again, anger, loyalty, desire for glory, some kind of emotion. And we're going to try to find what it is that will motivate that person or activate that part of someone's emotional state in order to get them to do what we want them to do. The last one we'll call the appeal to morals or morality. This is where the application of one's personal or universal sense of right and wrong dictates their actions, whether it be a change in actions or a further extent of those actions, meaning to move from thoughts and beliefs to an actual active state. This is similar to, but not the same thing as an appeal to ethics, which are situational or conditional senses of right and wrong, which aren't necessarily applied to all circumstances or scenarios. The simple sense is, you know, if you think all lying is wrong, then when you're engaged in a competitive activity like a sport, or a game. Do you consider deception to be acceptable, if not even desired, as part of the process of trying to win? Well, if that's the case, then ethically speaking, you may think it's wrong to cheat in school, but maybe entirely appropriate to fake someone out in a basketball game. All right, let's get into some advertising techniques. The following slides are grouped for purposes of trying to get things to make a little more sense and give you fewer ideas to keep track of. But bear in mind, each of the individual types on these slides is content and test material, so make sure you know each of them and how they're unique. First of all, testimonial. You're, so you're familiar with the idea of giving testimony such as in a court of law. In this case, a person or group advocates for a particular product or service. The three types are celebrity testimonial, where a person's celebrity status or their simple fame or notoriety is supposed to be enough reason for you to want to believe them or accept what they're trying to promote. An expert assumes this person has particular knowledge or, ex or experience or expertise 
in an area of field which gives them a unique insight, a deeper insight into that product or services qualities. Whereas a consumer testimonial is very similar to other, other techniques like, say, plain folk, where an average everyday person is talking about the experience they have with that product or service. Bear in mind, even celebrities are obvious, but for expert or consumer, be aware that sometimes not only are these individuals being compensated for their testimonials, but sometimes they're not even the actual individual who gave the testimonial in the first place. It might be an actor playing the role of an expert or pretending to be that actual consumer. Don't be surprised if sometimes you find that actors you've seen on obscure TV shows actually show up as supposed consumers or medical experts on commercials. All right, appeals. Now, it's going to be confusing that we're using the same term again, but we're talking about this as a good technique. These are types of appeals down below. Now, a particular idea is used to make us want something. For example, eye appeal. It's not just something physically looking appealing. It's almost used exclusively for food. It's designed to make us feel hungry. But you have to watch out for little tips and tricks like how on cereal boxes, oftentimes it's not milk that's used with the cereal. It's actually Elmer's glue. Or if you have food that's steaming, you'll find that actually there's a steam iron like you'd use for ironing shirts or clothes underneath the table, and that steam isn't it. There's painted fruits and vegetables and things that are false and not even actually food. There might literally be paint on them as opposed to just different colors of food dye. But the idea is to make us want that because it looks so good, even if it doesn't match how it looks when you go buy the product yourself. Youth appeal. Generally speaking, it's about the feeling that younger is better. Even if you're not going to be younger because you can't go back in time, that feeling younger is better than feeling how you do right now. This is primarily going to be geared toward those folks who are older than the target age they're, they're striving for. It's not just making someone feel like a kid again, but it might be making someone feel like a teenager again, or a 20-something, or like they just turned 25 and the world's ahead of them, like they just finished college or high school. That kind of sense. Sex appeal doesn't necessarily have to be very complicated, but oftentimes this is used as a way of dictating what's considered attractive, what's considered appealing or alluring. This is absolutely an example where, just like youth appeal is primarily geared toward the, those folks who are older and rarely, if ever, at those who are young, sex appeal is more dangerous in terms of how it depicts and discusses women and their sex appeal compared to males. Consider that even if a, if a commercial isn't necessarily about what a woman should look like, oftentimes it's, they'll be portrayed in that commercial as if a young man does something to make himself look more attractive, women will throw themselves at him. See commercials for body sprays, colognes, and things like that. Snob appeal. The idea of this is that it's trying to make you feel like you're better than somebody else. Snobs have something that's rare or unique or not something that not everybody else possesses, whether it be a personal quality or a physical object or having subscribed to a service. And so the idea is that you're one of a, of a carefully selected few and therefore people are looking at you with envy. Wordplay. A couple different slides here, different types of wordplay. The idea here is that specific, specific words and phrases are used to help us desire that product or service. Things like special offers, sales, BOGOs for limited time. That is, I, the idea is that it, it doesn't necessarily carry on permanently or they might want you to buy 5 for $5 or 10 for $10 in order to get you to buy more than one. Something new. You know, the idea that new is good and old is bad even if it's not necessarily new and improved. Well, why wouldn't it be improved if they made it new? And it's because the box is new doesn't mean the product is newer or any better. Tech talk, especially true in terms of computers and other kinds of technology. You may not necessarily know what all those numbers and stats mean, but if they tell you it's a good thing, then you'll say, but it has this. It has, it's, it's not 24 of this, it's 48 or 64 or 128 or 1,000. And because it's more than what you had before, it's better, even if you can't see with a naked eye how much better the screen actually is because it's so small. Glittering generalities. These are specific words that are used to avoid actually expressing any kind of specific details. You know, the things like comparative pieces like it's the best of all time or better than last year or, you know, never been better. It doesn't really actually explain anything, it just says that it's making some kind of vague comparison. The term glittering is, is from the expression, all that glitters isn't gold. Statistics. Numbers don't lie, people do. I learned that back in one of my stats classes in college. 
that numbers are used to skew perception. Think of your four out of five dentists recommend try that for the patients who chew gum. First of all, no one's saying that dentists want people to chew gum. But of the ones that do, four out of five. Well, did they ask only five? Did they ask a thousand and eight hundred of them said so? What do the other two hundred say? Statistics oftentimes leave more questions than answers, but numbers themselves sound convincing because they appear to be concrete. Also, symbols. Are words, images, or logos that associate with ideas? They don't need any explanation. You'll see this in terms of especially selling sporting goods or fan type objects. Just because you put a Vikings logo on something or Green Bay Packers colors on something, does that necessarily mean that it's a better product? No, but it also is, it can be used, for example, to get someone to want to buy more. Maybe you have one already, but now they have it in your team colors and you want a second one. So sometimes it's used not only to get people to buy, but to buy over and over again. Other things to be aware of with advertising techniques. Watch out for weasel words. These words that indicate a real bias, they're trying to, they're very slippery, they're very slick. Limited quantities available. What does that actually mean for a limited time? How long is that? They're not actually telling you, they're not giving you clarity on that. If someone is trying to convince you of something by talking about how it's, you know, the best ever, again, a lot of techniques, the words themselves are kind of weaselly and slick. Product placement is another technique I want you to have some familiarity with. Product placement can be two ways. It can be in terms of an actual placement of a product. There's a great clip from the movie Wayne's World where the guys are talking about selling out. And they're all, they're like, all the labels are out. You ever notice that in your movies and TV shows? The labels are almost always facing out. Even if it's not the label, you can tell the logo of that product. And odds are pretty good. They place that on purpose. Even if they turn around the product so that you can always see it. Even think about the back of a laptop. You ever notice how the Apples and the Dell and the HP, that's not facing the way of the person who's using the computer, it's facing out for somebody else to see. If you think about in terms of companies um, purchasing or paying for scoreboards at schools, same idea. Product placement also applies on a local scale in terms of when you're actually in a store. There's a term called a lost leader where simply a store puts things in an ad, this sells basically a free or free after rebate, and literally they're taking a loss on that particular product but the idea behind it is to get you in the store and so you'll buy the things that either are related to it or other deals that look good so they help you actually spend more money than you would have because they got you in the store and you otherwise may not have shopped there this week tie-ins are also used and there's another number of terms for this um, sometimes it's called partnered marketing for example where literally if you buy one of something you get something else that's may not necessarily be related for free for at a reduced count. If you buy a movie, for example, at Cub Foods, where I used to work, sometimes they'll have deals where you can get candy and popcorn and other things to go with it if you want to spend more than you would on that DVD, for example, than, say, at a competing store. Tines also have to do with displays in the store, whether it be on the end caps or in the front aisle when you first come in. If you have chips, of course, they're going to have some kind of salsa or a dip with it, even if those are on sale. Other types of terms. Wrapping it up. So the big picture, bandwagon, you know peer pressure, everybody's doing it, everybody's buying it, everybody's part of it. Plain folk, the opposite of snob appeal. These are what normal people do. They, they're not like those other people out there who are think they're better than everybody else. Public services. It's not just for things that apply to the public good, but anything where a company talks about, see how much we care about you, how much we take care of the environment, that sort of thing. Feelings. Particular emotions, fears, if you don't do this, look out. Think about security, identity theft. Happy family, because I love you, if you do this, your family will be all happy and better. Transfer, we had a good time when we did this or bought this or went there, then if you do it, you'll feel the same way. Magic, basically this illogical thought that if I do this, I buy this, if I have this, everything's going to be better, even if I can't explain how it works. And of course, humor. Other things to think about, the medium or media of your advertising dictates kind of who you're who you're targeting it to as well as what your limitations are in terms of visuals audio 3d that sort of thing audience keep in mind unintended and intended audiences who you're trying to target with that and who might also watch it target to parents but maybe kids also see it also think about primary and secondary audiences same kind of concept we know that's the main audience but we also might include others as well that's a lot of information I hope you tracked it all if you need to watch it again